All right, I guess we'll start. Um, I'm sure we'll have a few stragglers come in as we go along here. This is uh, probably one of my favorite classrooms just because it's so big and accommodates so many people. Um, that being said, though, most people tend to stop showing up about week three, so there'll be like 10 people in the front row, which is totally fine by me too. All right, um, this is intro to web programming, so if you're expecting this to be like police foundations or medical or something like that, you're in the wrong class, obviously. Uh, otherwise, you're here to learn web programming. You guys have had, had like HTML, right? And CSS, but you haven't had any JavaScript or anything like that yet, right? Touched on it, yeah. All right. Well, this is uh, this is unfortunately PHP. I apologize for that, but that's what we're going to be learning is PHP. Um, that being said, very simple language to learn, easy to grasp. Doesn't take much to get into it. Definitely much easier than working in say like Java or in C sharp or anything like that, uh, because PHP is an interpretive language and not a compiled language, which means it actually processes your code line by line interprets it, and then spits out your feedback immediately. You don't need to run it through any compilation, which makes PHP a little simpler to learn when it comes to web programming. It also is one of the big boys in the web right now, powering more than 80% of the internet. So that's a pretty hefty amount of crappy code out there. Um, so let's uh, just do introductions real fast. <clears throat> what are we doing here? OK, so we're going to learn about web programming, not just about PHP. We're just using PHP as the language to help facilitate what we're going to learn. We're actually going to learn you know, how a request cycle works. That's when the user actually goes to their browser, enters in some information, and what happens from that point on, right? We're going to talk about dynamic web, which is um, instead of just having like static web pages, we can actually give a user a personal experience by dynamic or dynamifying, if that's a word, um, the content that they actually see using a database and um, a server-side language. Uh, so that's what we're going to be learning in this class over the next 14 weeks. Uh, further through this slide deck, we'll talk about the actual 14 weeks in detail, also the sample project that we're going to be building over the next 14 weeks. Cool. So I've got the wrong slide deck open. Give me one second. Thought I was in the right one, but I am not. It's been a long day. I've been working since 8.30 this morning. Um, there we go. That's better. I'm Sean. Hi. Um, I've been programming for about 19 years. Not professionally, though. I mean, I dabbled in it as a hobby in like 2000 and then did that for quite a few years. Built a few websites, built a few company websites, uh, nothing big. But I actually started taking it seriously. I had a bad accident in 2012. I used to be a low voltage installer and I had a bunch of drywall fall on me and crushed my leg. So from that, I decided I'm going to go back to school, do something different. So I took programming uh, here at Georgian, actually. Graduated in 2014, been teaching since 2015. Um, but I also work out in the industry as well. I work for a company called uh, G-Shift or Mintent. Uh, they just recently got acquired. Uh, we basically build like um, SEO tools for marketers. That's essentially what we do. Um, we scrape Google, basically. Uh, yeah, so I started with PHP and JavaScript and HTML and CSS and all that type of stuff. And then slowly progressed into other languages. Ruby is pretty much my favorite and default language that I work in. Uh, that being said, we are moving more into JavaScript just because it's so cheap to scale. Um, so I work with Node and React and all that type of stuff as well. Uh, I also have experience in C++ and Python. So if you have programming questions at any point that don't even pertain to PHP, feel free to ask at any point. I have no problem helping people out with other classes as well, um, especially considering I generally teach those other classes too. So <laughs> uh, yeah, so let's move to the next one. So my industry experience, like I said, went to Georgian. I work at Georgian. <laughs> I've been here for four years now. Yeah, it's four years this September, actually. Um, and then G-Shift Mintent. Uh, I work for a small web company in Aurelia called Fireside. Uh, I built them a model view controller system that they now use as their main product uh, out of PHP. Um, and then did various freelance and stuff, and then, yeah, graduated. Cool. Also went to university for a very small stint. Learned I don't know math. Very the hard way after eight months. 
of doing game development at uh, UOIT. Uh, difficult class, difficult course, but uh, definitely worth your while. Interestingly enough, your program actually bridges into the UOIT University program. So when you're done your two or three years that you are here, you can actually apply to UOIT and start two years into your bachelor's, if that was something you were thinking about doing. Um, but yeah, it was a great experience. We built a little game called Dark Reach Origins, uh, which was kind of fun. Um, yeah, it wasn't too bad, actually. I, I did enjoy the time I was there. It's just math is a pain in the butt. Really hard and necessary if you're going to do game development. <laughs> uh, expectations. I don't have a lot of expectations. Be here, but I imagine some of you have jobs. You're probably not going to be here all the time. That being said, be here also classifies as please watch the YouTube video or at least follow the lesson plan so you have a clue of what we're doing. Uh, we're going to move through this course pretty quick. Uh, with programming analyst students, because I assume you all like programming, and I'm assuming that you want to be programmers. Um, I don't tend to handhold through simplistic code. I, I tend to graze over it pretty quickly. Um, so we're going to progress right into MVC in the second half of the semester, uh, whereas with the web students, I don't do MVC, because they just it, it takes too long to get there. Um, but with you guys, we're going to try to go into MVC. The good news about that is next semester you have advanced web programming, which will be with Rich, I would assume. Have you guys had Rich yet? Rich Freeman? No? Oh, you'll meet him next semester. So uh, that'll be ASP.NET uh, with web forms and MVC as well. Um, so at least you'll have a better understanding of how MVC works, because we're going to build our own custom MVC system from the ground up. So you'll understand all the aspects of MVC by the time you're done this class. Um, so obviously being here, or at least being interactive through the Slack channel that I posted and stuff like that, uh, helps everybody to kind of get a grasp of who you are. Uh, we will be doing a group project. Actually, the, the gradables in this class are fairly simple. Um, but we'll be doing group-based projects. You don't have to work in a group if you don't want to. I never force that, because um, I know a lot of people like just do it on their own. Uh, but that being said, um, obviously, if you're trying to choose a group or get people to help you and stuff like that, it helps if they know who you are. So being around, kind of being interactive with your colleagues will definitely improve your chances of that. Um, plus, it ensures you get your money's worth. You know, like, I see, hopefully I'm not generalizing, but I see a lot more international students in here than, than other students. Uh, so I know you guys pay an exceptional amount of money to be here. Um, so if you want the biggest bang for your buck, show up because it's definitely, you know, you definitely get more worth for what you paid. Um, also, plus class discussions sometimes break out and we wind up talking about lots of things. And even though I do record my lessons, there is the occasional technical difficulty where a lesson gets closed out and I don't wind up posting it. So that can happen. YouTube videos are a... That's what I'm looking for. A convenience, they are not a necessity. So I will try to post them. I will post for all three classes because I teach the Monday, Tuesday PHP as well. So I will post for all three classes. So if you miss the Wednesdays, you should be able to get the stuff you need from the Mondays or the Tuesdays. Um, that being said, too, if you're going to miss the Wednesday class uh, and you want to show up to another one of the classes instead to catch it live, um, just send me a message and let me know. And most times, like I said, by week three, this will reduce to about 20 people, so there'll probably be room. Uh, there's room now, it's like, so, so we're probably fine. Cool. <clears throat> be on time. I always start two minutes in. I give two minutes for people to travel. It seems to be like the magic number. Uh, two minutes seems to be the perfect amount of time for people to get here, and not too many people are lagging behind. Uh, it shows dedication, obviously. It proves your value and your worth to your colleagues. Um, what else? Participate. I hate just doing three hours of lecturing up here, looking at a sea of faces, most of them sleeping. It's just super boring. Um, plus, it's late. Holy crap, this is the latest class I've ever taught. 7 o'clock. All three of my PHP classes are at 7 p.m. till 10 p.m., which sucks because I work at 8.30 tomorrow morning. <laughs> so yeah, uh, yeah, so please, let's keep each other awake. Um, Class discussions plus are a strong part of learning. Sometimes I may forget a specific detail about something and you might know it. So sometimes just even bringing it up will help educate those around you. Even if you know the answer, I know a lot of people like to do that. They, they ask questions they already know the answer to, but they're doing it to help facilitate learning amongst their peers of things that they might think are important or interesting. So it's definitely work, worthwhile if you uh, engage. Um, also helps me learn and remember who you are. I don't do that whole meet and greet thing at the beginning of the class because I, 
I just find it annoying. Um, plus, then you're like put on the spot and you got to try to answer those stupid questions. Just make sure if you're talking to me, tell me who you are because that's how I'm going to remember who you are and I'm going to learn who you are. Over time, I will learn all of you. Over time. I have 131 students this semester, so it's going to be interesting. Um, cool. Academic misconduct, this wonderful subject. Unfortunately, over the last five years, it's grown quite a bit. The college has kind of an interesting view of academic misconduct with professors and instructors. I'm an instructor, not a professor. I'm not, I don't have university and publishing and stuff like that. So just, I'm an instructor. Better yet, just call me Sean. Don't call me sir. Don't call me professor. Don't call me any of that. Just call me Sean, please. Um, that being said, so what we've noticed is over the last five years, there's been a lot more um, like plagiarism and copyright and stuff like that. Um, that being said, though, the college's approach to it is it's kind of left to us to do what we want to do. They have a recommendation, which is we do the strike policy where we, we send your information off to the registrar's office and it gets processed through the registrar's office. I don't do that because I don't have time. It's um, I have to fill out a whole bunch of paperwork with you. I have to meet up with your coordinator. I have to transfer all that information to your coordinator. It's a lot of back and forth. And it's it's always at times where I'm not available because it's during the work day and I'm at work during the work day. <laughs> so I zero people out. That's all I do. So if I catch cheating, I zero you out. Um, if I catch cheating twice, I zero out your course and you just don't come back. That's it. And you can negotiate, obviously, and talk to me. And raise concerns with Ross, if that's what you want to do. That's totally fine. But I've never had anybody win that. But anyways, uh, be legit. Don't plagiarize. Don't infringe. Don't copyright. Don't trademark. Don't buy from Fiverr. <laughs> I, I never had that happen until last semester when I had somebody hand in their project that was definitely a Fiverr. And um, yeah, it pissed me off because it was hard to track down and actually prove it was a Fiverr. So, yeah, I found a way around it for this semester, but yeah, that was annoying. Please don't hire a fiver. It's obvious when your test is zero because you don't know what you're doing, but then you have this project that's like semi-perfect. <laughs> kind of stands out a little. Um, not to mention it's embarrassing. If I catch you cheating, it's embarrassing for both of us, right? It's embarrassing. Well, it's more embarrassing for you than it is for me, but it's annoying. Um, I'm not going to go through that. You can definitely read that on your own. I have published these as a PDF as well. If you are unclear of what you're doing as academic misconduct, please just reach out and I'll let you know. It's pretty obvious. If you're copying and pasting a block of code into your project, that's likely academic misconduct. What you're doing there is you're copying somebody else's idea. It's different when you take a concept and then make that concept your own in your own code. That's totally different. But just copying and pasting complete projects, yeah, that's, that's academic misconduct. All right. You can look at all that if you want to. Um, cool. I will say this, though. Why do I care if people cheat? Because I know like some instructors will come on and they just they don't really care all that much. They'll just kind of do the same thing, zero it out, or they'll just constantly negotiate. Um, I kind of care more so because I work in the industry and it affects my pay, right? So the more people out in the industry that can't do the job, the lower the pay scale goes because people don't want to pay people who can't pay the job. And because of that, my pay scale goes down too, right? So my opportunities decrease as well. It's the same with any other industry professional. Um, so people that can't do the job, we don't want them out in the industry. And it's actually better for you that if you're struggling or having troubles, for you to just come to me and I will help you. I'm, I'm extremely generous when it comes to my time. Um, so yeah, please, just reach out to me and I will help you get to where you need to be. It's easier than cheating. It's definitely better. Cool. Uh, due dates and submissions. So I teach three classes a week. I also work 40 hours at my job. I also volunteer at a local library in Aurelia for uh, teaching HTML and CSS to uh, youth and kids like 18 to 40. Um, so I teach that as well. So I'm pretty busy. That being said, the easiest way to get a hold of me is Slack. I usually respond within two hours. So any students from previous semesters will tell you right off the bat that Slack is 100% the way you contact me. Okay? If you want to send me an email, 
you can, but it can be up to 24 hours before I usually respond to emails. Um, just because I don't always get them. Sometimes Georgian changes our passwords, but we don't get a notification until the thing bounces. Stuff like that. So Slack is definitely the way to get a hold of me. You can join Slack. I've put the, um, the invite link up on Blackboard under resources. It's also under the syllabus, and it's also under the course information. So it's in three different places. The other benefit to that, do you guys have Chris Naismith this semester? No? There's a few other instructors on there as well. So previously, I ran my own Slack channel and just invited students to my own Slack channel, and we just did that. Uh, now we're actually starting to collaborate as instructors and all have one workspace. So when you join Slack, if you have a teacher that uses Slack, they'll be in that Slack space already. So you don't have to worry about joining other workspaces. They should already be there. Uh, the convenience of that, too, is say if you have Chris, he teaches JavaScript and you have a JavaScript question and you ask that question, I can answer it because I also teach JavaScript and I know the answer to it. So you can get quicker response from some instructor of some sort as long as they've taken the course or taught the course before. Cool. Uh, due dates. Due dates, I'm pretty flexible on due dates. Um, I usually will gauge how the class is progressing. If I find that we're kind of moving a little slow, then I'll just pull the due dates back a bit, usually about a week or two. Um, I give usually two weeks prior to any project piece that we're going to do. Uh, the project we're going to do in this class is pretty cool. It's a bit of a different idea. So usually when you take some of these classes, you wind up with like multiple labs, multiple assignments, multiple projects all in one class. I don't want to do that. I find that a lot of it just winds up repeating itself, and it's just redundant, and it creates extra work for you guys when you don't really have a ton of time. So instead, what we're going to do in this class is we're going to do one singular project. It's broken into six parts. Uh, each part will count as a piece of that project's total. The total grade for the whole project is 60% of your course mark. Um, but like I said, you get marked on each piece. So it'll be broken into six parts over the next 12 weeks, and you just do those six parts. That's it. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, submissions. Uh, most of our submissions will be, I haven't decided yet if we're going to do the submissions through Git. We probably will. Out of curiosity, have you guys used, who's used Git? before GitHub or Git. Oh, OK, cool. <laughs> um, we will talk about Git. I will teach you how to use Git, because it's hands down the number one tool that you need to be using, uh, especially if you're doing web development. So we will talk about Git. We'll, actually, today we're going to create a GitHub account. So you'll have a GitHub account. You'll create a repository. And then what we'll likely do is every week we'll push our project components to Git, so that way you get the experience with using Git. and then. You'll also be taking your, um, your projects, like your actual project that you're going to be working on, because you'll be collaborating with your friends. You'll put those into GitHub, I should say, stop saying Git, GitHub, and then you can actually share me the GitHub link instead of having to upload your entire project to Blackboard, which is much better. Right? Plus, I'm very lenient on those. Basically, as long as you're done pushing, by the time I start to mark it, I don't penalize you for lights on it. As long as the link's in Blackboard by the due date. If you want to keep, you guys don't know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. You want to keep pushing after the due date, that's fine. <laughs> All right, uh, you'll learn what pushing is later. OK, cool. <clears throat> the one thing about group work is always, I always say this, and nobody ever does it, and it's really annoying. Make sure your group members, there's a readme file in there with your group members. Every group member needs to submit the project. So important because I can't mark you if you don't. I've tried using Blackboard groups. They're shite, and I refuse to use them. They're the worst thing in the world. Just you and your friends, if you're in your group, make sure you all submit, all submit your readmes, and you're also going to submit a group evaluation. So last semester, I did complete group work. Worked out well, I find, with web programming because it's a little different than Java, um, and it confuses students sometimes. Working in a group helps you kind of like work off each other and learn a little bit quicker and easier. Um, plus, we have enough things that you that mark you singularly anyways. So I feel like that will definitely benefit you guys to work in groups. Uh, that being said, though, there, there's always the guy who doesn't you know, put his weight in, right? It happens. So if you want, uh, so you can actually do the group review, and then you can kind of say, hey, buddy didn't do this, right? So, and then they get a bit of a different mark, right? That's the way it works. Cool. We'll talk more about that when we actually have an assignment to talk about. Uh, cool. Group evaluations, group dynamics. Group dynamics, basically be an adult. If you have a problem, try to deal with it internally. 
if it becomes a huge issue and you need to talk to me, then arrange to talk to me. All right. Agenda for the average class. We'll do a sign-in. That'll start next week. The sign-in is basically just so I know who's here. Helps me kind of put a face to a name. That kind of thing. It makes my life a little simpler. Um, we'll do a previous class review. So at the beginning of every class, we'll always review the previous class because immediately after that, we will do an in-class quiz. In-class quizzes will be five to ten question stops. Take ten minutes. Totally quick and easy. Um, We'll introduce the day's agenda, so whatever we're going to talk about that day. So for example, today we're going to do a little bit of PHP syntax. Next week we'll also do some PHP syntax. That's it. Two weeks of PHP syntax. And then after that we'll get right into actually building out a CRUD system. Uh, CRUD stands for Create, Read, Update, and Delete. Just so you're aware. Uh, interactive lectures. I only do interactive lectures. I don't do these two slide decks we're going to see today is the only two slide decks you will ever have in this class. Uh, there will be no more slide decks after that point because I hate building them and they're annoying. Uh, otherwise, it's me coding and you guys watching and we're working off each other and we build out our project. That's basically what happens. Uh, In-class project support. If we find that there's like open time at the end of a class, um, often we'll see, like I imagine most of you will just want to leave because it's so bloody late. But otherwise, uh, we'll do in-class project support. I won't ever leave before 10, so you have me to rely on if you need help with your projects, okay? Uh, even if it doesn't have to do with this class. Uh, and then two time breaks as needed. I do 20 minutes when it's these late classes because nothing's open, so you can't really do anything or go anywhere. Um, so I do two 10 minute breaks and then that usually gives us enough time. And then if we have time left over at the end of class, then you kind of just kick off 10 minutes early, right? So, cool. Any questions about anything I've talked about prior to this slide? Okay. If you do, you can always contact me on Slack and ask as well. Communicating with me, Slack, number one way. Remember that. It's on that quiz that you're going to have today. <laughs> Slack is the number one way to communicate with Sean. Um, otherwise, you can meet me, you can email me, or you can meet me before class. Um, <clears throat> instructors don't get paid for time outside of class. We only get paid for time in class. Uh, so, and not to mention I live in Aurelia. I don't live in Barrie. So coming to meet you here is a little tricky. So what I do instead is I kick off work an hour at like at 6 o'clock, and then I come here for 6, and I, I'm here from 6 to 7. So I give you an hour before each of my classes. Cool thing is I'm teaching three classes this semester, so you can meet me between 6 and 7 on Mondays, Tuesdays, or Wednesdays. The inconvenient part is my office isn't static. It moves to whatever class I'm currently teaching in. And I'm in three different classes this semester, which is super weird, but I'm in K324, which is, where are we, that way? I think it's that way. And then uh, M1110, I've never taught a class in the medical building ever, but yeah, it's that way. And then E104. Okay. Right. <clears throat> and then the course syllabus. Let's talk about the course syllabus. Cool. So, I'm not sure if any of you have actually seen this yet. Uh, let's change this so it displays over there. Change it so it's the proper size. Cool. All right, under Blackboard. Now, can you see this current Blackboard shelf? Like you guys see this weekly thing? If you go to weekly learning, you'll see these folders here. Does anybody not see those folders under Blackboard? Cool. Because you guys are like group three, but Monday is group two and Wednesday is group one, so they're, they're not in order, so it's, and it's tricky to find out that information. So I wanted to make sure I got it right. All right, so you'll see all the lesson in here. Um, there's our lesson plan. Every week, the lesson plan will be there. If you don't have this link for some reason, it doesn't matter. If you click it, you will see that it's an app that I've built. Um, I've been using this for about three semesters now. And I love it. it just, it's easy for me to build out a lesson plan, and it's easy for you to be able to take a look at the lesson plan. I say lesson plan, but these are actually closer to like textbook. There's, they're full write-ups. Most of them are about 12,000 words. Like There's a huge chunk of information in here. There's also a JavaScript piece in here as well for JavaScript frameworks right now. But the one you want is the intro to web programming using PHP. There's only one lesson in there currently. You can click on the introducing PHP, and there's the lesson plan. So you can see there's our introductions, our class etiquette, the misconduct stuff we talked about, and the typical format. But let's talk about this piece here. 
Let me zoom in a little bit. Make it senior size. <clears throat> All right, the overview for the next 14 weeks. So this week, introducing web programming to you, obviously, what it's about, what it is, um, how it affects you, how it differs from application development. Uh, PHP syntax part one. So we're going to take a look at commenting variables, echoing to the screen, function, or not function, sorry. Uh, I think we get to repetition, decision structures and repetition. If we have time. If we don't, we'll push it to next week and finish it off next week. Pretty easy stuff, and a lot of it is very similar to, like, PHP is based on a C, right? So it's a lot of it's similar to what you would see in C. So, um, All right, cool. Uh, next week, we'll be doing the PHP syntax part two. We'll also do an HTML review because, you know, it's been a couple weeks since you touched HTML, so maybe we'll go over it again. Just forms, mostly, because that's what we'll be using 90% of the time is forms. Um, we won't be doing any design or styling in this class. Your projects, I want you to do some styling in your projects, but we'll be using Bootstrap, so we'll just make it super easy for ourselves. Um, cool. Capturing, selecting data using PHP. So basically, we're going to start with the first two letters of CRUD, create and read. Um, so that will be creating and reading to a database using PHP and MySQL. Uh, input validation and basic authentication. So we're going to actually create a user, and then the next week we'll actually implement password hashing, show you how password hashing works, and all that type of stuff. And then the following week, we'll be doing editing and deleting data from PHP. So we'll be covering CRUD in those three weeks, basically, and then plus the authentication. Then the last week, we'll be talking about deploying. CRUD review, so that way you have a review before the test. All tests are 50% theory, 50% practical. It's the way they work, and project support. And then our midterm, then reading week, then we'll be talking about classes in PHP. So PHP is a object-oriented programming language as of, well, properly an object-oriented programming language as of PHP 7, which is what we'll be using. Uh, it supports things like data types and stuff as well. Uh, so we'll be learning about classes. That's important for us to be able to build our MVC system, uh, plus error handling, which is obviously also very important. Uh, and then I'm going to introduce the MVC pattern, which stands for Model View Controller. Um, anybody familiar with MVC? Anybody ever touched MVC before? Like Laravel, Code Igniter, any of those guys? Okay, cool. Nice, brand new. It's a design pattern. It's not a programming language. It's not like a framework or anything. It's a design pattern. So you'll be learning that design pattern. Uh, we're going to, the following week, we'll be creating a router and a renderer. Uh, our views and our controllers, part one. The second week will be views and controllers, part two. And then we are going to roll our own modeling system, which will be very interesting. Not sure how complex we're going to make that. Uh, we might use a existing project, like PHP Active Record or something like that instead, but we'll talk about that at the time. Don't, don't worry about it now. And then if we have time, because there are holidays, I don't think you guys are affected by any of the holidays, the Monday classes, though. We're going to do search, filter, and sort data. And I'm not sure if we're going to do that in a complex way or a super simple way by using uh, JavaScript list um, library. I haven't decided yet. We'll figure it out at the time. All right, cool. Introducing web programming. Before we get to that, let's talk about our example project, because we might push that till after the break. So our example project will be a dynamic online resume, right? So hopefully you'll be able to use this. Uh, for you to submit to your prospective employers. So the front end will be made up with various sections displaying your qualifications and information about you. The back end will be a robust authenticated editor allowing you to modify your portfolio as you progress through your career. So you'll be able to add your skills, add little interactive features into it, that type of thing. Basically make it something that you can then submit to um, anybody that you're applying for. Now you guys are probably on co-op next semester. Yeah, so this, this is exactly what you want. Um, a lot of prospective employers, they're not so much concerned about the portfolio idea. If you're doing web, that is. Uh, they're more concerned about your Git. They're going to want to see your Git. So learning GitHub in this class will be definitely beneficial to you because then you can pass your GitHub link on to your employees. I actually even have mine on my wonderful website. This is not PHP. This is React. But down here, see? Git. And Steam. I don't know why I put Steam there, but I did anyways. <laughs> All right. The gradables. 
12 in-class quizzes. 10% is in-class, but obviously there's two bonus, so you can get up to 12% if you do all the quizzes. Quizzes are open the day of class, and they close out midnight the following day. And they're passworded. And you get the password here, <laughs> just, just to give you a heads up. Group project parts. The project will be broken into five parts, as I already explained. Uh, I make projects open-ended, which means I will tell you the bare minimums of what you require, and then you build literally whatever you want. So what I usually recommend to students is take advantage of that, and if you want to learn something, like say you want to learn CodeIgniter, for example, which is a MVC framework for PHP, um, you can then take advantage of that time, because you're building a project, to learn this new technology and stuff. So I like open-ended projects because it gives you guys more creative freedom of what you're building and allows you to take that time and spend it learning something different. Uh, one <laughs> presentation write-up, which is worth 10%, um, this is not one whole thing. It's not presentation and a write-up. It's presentation or a write-up. So not everybody likes to stand in front of the class and talk, but basically it's a presentation representing your project. You're going to talk about your project, what its features are, how it, what benefits it has, how it's going to solve world peace, whatever. And if you don't want to do that, if you don't want to stand up and talk about your project, instead you can do a write-up on your project, right? Not, not big, like literally 10% worth of work, not very big. Two major tests. Uh, it says 5% for theory and 10% for practical, but it's usually 50-50. I think I might have did that for a reason. I'll have to relook at my notes to see why. Uh, they'll make up 30%. And then I usually do up to 10% of bonus marks. That's 10% of real marks. So like you can actually achieve 112% in total in this class. Um, but obviously I can only give you 100, but at least it could bump you up, right? Um, the 10% actually is when you do things out of the box. So if you implement something that we didn't talk about, say you, I had a student with my first time I taught PHP, uh, he implemented a library API that actually reached out to the Simcoe County Library and pulled books out from the library by the IMDB. And actually, not IMDB, that's movies. The I, the thing, the code, the, the book code. <laughs> you pull it from the book code. What's it called? ISBN. That's the thing, yeah, the ISBN. You'd use, the, you'd use the ISBN and you'd pull them from the API. It was pretty smart. So yeah, of course you got a bonus because totally out of the box thinking. Cool. Group work, not required. Don't have to do it. A lot of people like to work independently. A lot of people work and don't really want to be tied to a group. Can't, you know, afraid of commitment, whatever. Um, so it's not required. Uh, all participants in a group have to submit a copy of the GitHub link. Uh, a group member review, based on the review, members would be graded differently. Uh, and a readme specifying each member's involvement in the work. A maximum of four group members is permitted. So you can have four people in your group. Okay? Uh, and two groups cannot combine <laughs> and work on the same project. It's four groups, separated projects. Uh, a Google Doc will be provided where you'll be able to actually enter the group member names. Uh, that's a lie. I'm probably not going to do that. Um, I do want to know what your projects will be about, but we'll probably make that uh, project part one. Project part one will be describing your project, what it's going to be about, who your group members are going to be, what you plan to achieve, that kind of thing. All right? Kind of a layout. All right, cool. Any questions? I realize that's like a getting hit in the head with just tons of info all at once. Train keeps rolling. <laughs> um, we can do 738. Yeah, let's quickly talk, because we're going to be doing tools next. Let's quickly talk about what web programming is, and then we'll be able to get into fun stuff after the break. <coughs> OK, cool. Intro to web programming. So I've primarily done web programming throughout my career. I did a little bit of C++ and UOIT. I taught C++ here. but like. Extremely basic stuff. Like I, I did build a, a rendering system that actually renders uh, shader code and stuff, but I never enjoyed it. I'm like, I'm a super nerd. I love data. I love working with data, like manipulating data, like doing things with data. I don't know why. That's just what I like. I've been into that since like I was 20. I absolutely love data. So the web is perfect for that because working with data is primarily what you'll do in the web. You'll work with either content that will be stored as data, you'll work with data analysis where you're dealing with numbers, sales numbers, stuff like that. 
Um, you'll be working a lot with data, especially you guys, because the idea of you leaving here and going to become web designers is not very practical for you, probably not very profitable for you either. Um, it would make more sense for you guys to work in like web applications and stuff like that, right? Like bigger things that pay more money. Um, so yeah, let's do a quick insight. So the goal when we're done this course is that you'll stop looking at the web as a user. So you won't be looking at the web anymore like, oh cool, look at the pretty background. Oh awesome, I can click a button. You'll start seeing it more as a developer and start asking those questions like, how the hell did you do that? <laughs> right? And start taking a look and start breaking it down to see how those things were achieved. So let's take a comparison of a user versus a developer. So here's the user, right? User's going to enjoy some McDonald's, have a, a burger, maybe one of those new Big Macs, some fries and a pop, right? And they see the wonderful presentation of this meal. But what they don't see is the guy who makes it, right? The developer. The developer side, the one that actually puts the nitty gritty into actually building and developing this wonderful thing, or even going further down the chain, the guy that creates the assembly line type operation that makes McDonald's so successful, right? Yeah, those are, those are big things. Give me one second. I just want to make it so I can see my notes. I don't mind ad-libbing, but I prefer to see my notes. There we go. All right, or let's take a look at this, right? The ceiling at the Sistine Chapel, right? Enjoyed by millions of tourists every year. Does anybody know who painted the ceiling at the Sistine Chapel? Yeah, it was that guy, right? Michelangelo painted the ceiling, but not him, it was actually this other guy, that, that guy, which skipped away. Come back. Animations are a train wreck when it comes to slide decks, hence why I don't like making slide decks. There, that guy. <laughs> User wants a stylish haircut, right? I don't have any hair, so. <laughs> the user wants a stylish haircut, rocks the mullet. So the developer, they would be responsible for designing, the cutting, the stylish. I don't think I would ever go to these people, ever go to these people. But they're responsible for actually creating the look, right? So user versus developer. When we look at web, we think of things like what makes up a web page, right? So we've got like select boxes and navigation and stuff like that. And when we think about that as a user, we just interact with these things. We don't really question what's happening behind the scenes. But like a select box you'll remember from your HTML class is actually the wonderful select tag. And then you create your options using your uh, option tags, right? And every time you want to add a new option, you've got to add this option tag. When we see a header, for example, they see the wonderful Google logo, right? But we see a lot more intricacy. We see the div that actually makes it up, the styling, inline styling that they've created, um, any of the alignments, that, that, that type of stuff, and any actual extra sub divs that might be created in order to get things aligned exactly where they need to go. In addition to that, we might even also see the CSS that is required to actually create that logo and be able to put it in place exactly where it needs to be and all the requirements there, not to mention also the media queries we have to run in order to deal with responsive web, right? Did you guys uh, learn responsive web in your HTML class? Like media queries with CSS for dealing with sizes? Okay, cool. <clears throat> User might see an image gallery, like a light box gallery, like that. Developer sees a whole lot of libraries and work. <laughs> HTML5, implementing PhotoSwipe, implementing their MySQL database to store the images, maybe some AWS for S3, and CSS as well. So why web development? Why would anybody choose to build web applications over desktop applications? Right? What is the biggest reason that that's so important? And the reason now is because we're trying to get to this cross-platform environment, right? Where we don't have to worry about an application only running on my machine, so to speak. We don't want it to only run in Windows, or only run in Linux, or only run in 
Mac, right? We want them to be able to be cross-platform. And web applications are becoming bigger and broader. And you can think of web applications a little further than just your Chrome browser. Steam, right? The Steam interactive browser that you work with is a web application. The whole thing interacts with your uh, video game system, or your video games in your library. It pulls them from a database through using HTTP requests. All that type of stuff is still happening. It's interacting just the same as a web browser does. It works exactly the same way. Web application available on Windows, Mac, and Linux, right? And more applications are becoming like that. You can actually play your PHP library now directly on your Windows or Mac machine. And eventually I can see PS, PS Now coming to your Linux box as well, because at the end of the day, it's just a streaming service, right? All they need to do is stream it or Google Stadia, or any of these other big type of applications that are coming out. And even um, Adobe is talking about doing the whole creative cloud in a web interface so that you're not reliant on hardware specifications. That's the other piece, right? The web applications. Web applications tend to be light and lean, right? We don't usually make them fairly bulky or big, and we want them light and lean so that we can run them in a browser. And the convenience of that is that we can actually then rely on things like servers to do the heavy lifting. Right, so when you play uh, Google Stadia or if you play PS Now, for example, all that stuff is happening on a server, on a computer, you know, with uh, it, it's running eight cores, has two titans in it and stuff like that. You get all this beefy power coming out of this server and all it's really doing is sending a video feed back to your browser, which is great because then you don't need all the hardware in your system right in front of you. So the web applications, it's to me, this is... This is um, Pass. Like, this is so antique of an idea of web application versus desktop applications. Both require, both are needed these days, right? You need a desktop application for operating system, but at the end of the day, any application should be able to run in the web at some point. And eventually, I think you'll see that. <clears throat> cool. So, how does the web actually work? The funny thing is, a lot of people don't really know what happens when you type in that wonderful address into the address bar, you just accept the fact that, oh, now, cool, I've got a page. I can now go to mypony.com, right? <laughs> that type of thing. Everything is great that way, but there's actually quite a bit that actually occurs when it comes to the web. So, for example, a static website works basically like this. A user, so there's our users, right? A user uses a client. Right, So the clients are the browsers, but you're not necessarily restricted to browsers. Like I said, Steam is technically a client. It's a web client. Um, you have clients on your phone as well, like maybe you do Wealthsimple or something like that, or your CIBC or banking account, whatever's on your phone. Those are all web-based clients as well. Uh, so the user uses a client to make a request. Right, Usually you type an address in the address bar. That's a request. The second you hit enter, you're actually submitting a request to the World Wide Web. Uh, when you open up your banking information, type in your password and hit enter, you're now submitting a request to some sort of endpoint. Something at the other end is going to listen to it. So the request is sent to a server. That's that thing there. That hosts the website through a series of routers and exchanges. It's Definitely something we'll leave for advanced web programming, but suffice to say that when you type in your address, that address that you're typing in, it's actually just an alias for a number. It's a, a slew of numbers known as an IP address. Um, but there has to be a lookup that has to happen. So what happens is your request goes through and it bounces to all these different exchanges that basically try to find the endpoint. Like, where the hell is the server? And it, you'd think it would only go to one, but it doesn't. It can actually jump. 50 times before you finally get to the end point where the server actually exists. Uh, so the request is sent to the server that hosts the website through a series of routers and exchanges. The server evaluates the extension of the requested file. So at the end of your file, you'll have .html. Now here's an interesting fun fact that a lot of people don't realize. When you make a request on a web server for whatever, www.seanmckinnon.ca slash index.html, index.html is actually a physical file on the server. It's, like, it's literally called index.html. Just the same as the files on your computer. That server that you're trying to contact, that's exactly what it is. It's just a computer. It's a computer with a file system, and they have a bunch of files inside of it. The difference is, is that the server also has a piece of software 
that basically takes a look at your request, looks at what you're requesting, and decides whether or not you're okay to actually view this thing that you're asking for, right? So that's where they restrict it down. You can only access HTML files. You can only access CSS files. You can only access images. So they can restrict it, right? And then it goes a step further. When it actually goes to find the file, it only finds the file in a specific location on the server. It's not like it can get out to the other directories on the server. It's a specific directory that it has access. So imagine if on your computer, and I know I'd like to do this for my mother-in-law, restrict her to one file folder so she can't go anywhere else. She can only view that one file folder. That's essentially what a server is. A server is like a computer for seniors. It basically says, you can only access this one folder. You aren't allowed to go anywhere else in the computer except for this folder, and you can only look at the files that I say are okay. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so servers are actually quite simple. They're just a computer. It just has a scary word, right? Server just seems like a scary thing. Um, but they're really not. They're actually quite simple. Uh, did you guys take networking? already in your first semester? Awesome. So some of this should make sense already. In networking, you understand requests because you had to handle the request going through. Did you guys set up a web server? See, I always found that weird that they don't get you to set up a web server. It's like one of the coolest, easiest things to set up. But yeah, all right. Did you use Linux? No. You guys used uh, the Hexer networking class used. Yeah? It's uh, Cisco-based. Cisco. Like router, and right. Did you take that last semester? Do you guys have Connor in your class? Tall guy with long, curly, blonde hair and a big beard? Yeah, you did have Connor? I work with Connor, actually. Connor works where I work. Yeah, Connor's a fun guy. Call him the Viking. Looks like a big Viking. Yeah. All right, if the file requested isn't a script. So that is an important thing to understand. If the file isn't a script. So browsers understand a very specific group of files. That's it. They understand HTML, and they will parse it. They'll take a look at your HTML code. They will change it, modify it, render it, and parse it and put it onto the browser. Awesome. They understand CSS. They know that CSS is targeting the HTML. They understand that. So they'll read it, compile it, parse it. They understand JavaScript natively. They also understand VBScript, which a lot of people didn't know, but they do. They understand VBScript. Most browsers now understand PDF, and they'll actually read a PDF or a text document or an image. What they don't understand is .php. They don't understand .rb, which is Ruby. They don't understand .asp. They don't know what those things are. They don't know what they mean. So the server is responsible for converting whatever that is into something the browser will comprehend. So when you make a request for a PHP website right, and a PHP file, the server stops like an intermediary. It's basically called middleware. It stops in the middle. The file comes in. It transpiles that file, interprets it, converts it all to HTML, and then sends it off to the browser. Same with Ruby. Comes in, interprets it, grabs whatever actual HTML is in there, and transmits that off to the browser. You don't want PHP or Ruby or any of your scripts to go out directly to the browser without that compilation step. Because what will happen is the browser doesn't know what those are, so it will put them out as plain text. So all of your nice secure PHP code is now plain text <laughs> sitting in the browser. So that's something that you have to be cautious about, but the cool thing is, is most server setups that you will do are usually done for you, or you use things like droplets that make it super simple. It's not something you really need to know how to build right now. There's a lot of solutions out there that just do it for you, and they already secure it and everything else. So all you have to do is write the code, right? That's what we'll be doing in this class, just writing the code. Cool. Dynamic website, not super different than a static website, except for that a Static website usually only deals with the files that the browser understands. So it will only be HTML, CSS, images, text, PDFs, that type of stuff, right? Won't be any PHP, won't be any ASP.NET, won't be RB or anything like that, or JSX or any of that type of stuff. So how are dynamic web page actually processed? So the user, just like you did with the client, is going to make a request to the server. Only this time he's asking for index.php. Okay. The request gets sent to the server, 
that hosts the website, the server evaluates the extension just like it did before. And because it doesn't end in HTML, it knows that the PHP file needs to be transpiled. So it sends the request to the server with the intentions of taking whatever comes back and transpiling it. So we send it off. That's a whole slew of server technologies. Python, Golang, PHP, JSP, Ruby. I can't remember which one the camel is. Or that little swiggly thing. I think that swiggly thing is ASP.net. There's a whole bunch of different server-side technologies. There's also things like Cold Fusion, which was like an Adobe product way back in the day. There's tons and tons of server-side languages. Um, but anyways, not all of them are transpiled like this, but all of them will return back to the server something that the server can understand, which will be HTML. If a script is requested, the script will run. And if it runs, it can now reach out to multiple other sources. So this is where we differ from a static site. Static site goes to the file folder directly. The file gets dropped back in the server. The server renders it back to uh, your browser. In this scenario, we pipe through our transpiler and then make our request. That script that's in there might now make a request to our file system, might make a request to our database, might make a request through the email. I had to build one of those. That was crazy hard. We had to basically set up an email server on our server and make it that when people emailed into the server, we would take the contents from the email, parse it, and put it into the database as like analytics, all because we were trying to thwart Google Analytics. It was kind of interesting, but it was fun. It was cool. So all of that is going to compile back towards, and it's going to take all that information, compile something it's going to understand in the, in the uh, client, and then send it back out. So the big differences between static and dynamic. Static. Data content is entered directly into the HTML page. They are static pieces of information, hard-coded directly into your page. So if you were to build your resume site, you could put your name because it's not likely to change. You could add your skills and all this other stuff, but that's where we start to have a problem because your skills will change, right? As you progress through your career, you're going to gain more skills, right? Or you might start to realize some of the skills that you've listed don't make sense anymore. So you start to eliminate them and start pushing certain skills to get that one key job that you're looking for. That's dynamic information, right? And if it's static, that means pulling open your HTML page every time, re-editing your HTML, and then having to resave it and re-upload it to your server. Whereas dynamic, Dynamic content is pulled from a database, right, or an API, or a file system. There's tons of different ways we can work with dynamic data. Um, but the key idea of dynamic data is that it's ever-changing. It's always in flux. We can constantly modify it, delete it, update it, right, the CRUD. Create, read, update, delete. You're going to hear me say that a hundred times, CRUD. Um, those four operations are crucial to dynamic web pages. And the cool thing about it is it means that your information is always in flux and it's never stale, right? Because you can actually modify it. Uh, everyone receives the same data and content when you have a static site. Doesn't matter who goes to the site, they all get the same content. It doesn't change for the user. However, with a dynamic site, you can actually customize that data based on the user. A lot of sites already do that, right? So if you go to Amazon and you're in the UK, for example, it will try to divert you to the UK store. If you're in India, it will convert the language over. Right? So you don't get an English Amazon, you get a different language in Amazon. Right, Things like that, those internationalization steps, only could apply if it was dynamic data. Because what the international, uh, internationalization step does is it actually reads the data that's inside the database, translates it, and then submits it back to the user. So it's a big operation. Um, dynamic data is super important. Data content mutation can be performed only with client-side scripting, and therefore it can be circumvented. So in a static website, if you wanted to dynamically change the data, you have to use JavaScript to dynamically change the data. You can use things like local storage to save like a temporary state of it. But the problem is, is all of that can be manipulated by the user because it's on the client. The client, the user, right? None of that is safe to you. None of that is secure information, right? You always treat that as malicious or hazardous information. So 
that's the thing. Static website, not really a ton of control over there. With dynamic, the data content mutation can be performed with the server-side scripting, and therefore it's guarded. So the information that you transfer from the server, because you control that stream of information, you can also control its security, right? So you can control its normalization, you can control its authentication as well. Um, User input is sanitized by client-side validation, which isn't secure on a static website. That is 100% true. Um, never believe anything that comes from the client, <laughs> ever. Don't just take information from the client and just throw it in the database and hope that it's OK, because that's how we wind up with a lot of different types of hacking, like SQL injections or uh, cross-site scripting or stuff like that. That's how those things occur. User input on the side of the dynamic is sanitized by the server, uh, validated, normalized, whatever you want to do. You control the amount of security. You can even encrypt it, right? Um, something that Target should have learned four years ago when they were storing passwords as raw data in raw text inside the database. Um, but you control all of that aspect, which is super cool. Data. What is data? Well, we're not going to get into that because we're going to be talking about data over the next few weeks um, so much that you will definitely know what data is. And I'm pretty sure you probably have a clue what data is already. Uh, we're not going to break down Facebook. The idea is that you understand that Facebook is dynamic, right? Facebook, it's your information that's on your Facebook account, my information that's on my Facebook account. It would be really bizarre if everybody was Mark Zuckerberg and only had Mark Zuckerberg's friends, right? That uh, would be super weird. So it's dynamic. It uses dynamic. And actually, they're like the biggest advocators for PHP because they build crap for PHP. However, they are moving into another realm. Does anybody also know their one major library that everybody uses right now? It starts with an R. Yeah, React. PHP owns React. That's their big baby, right? And they love React, um, which is cool because the college has embraced it as well. So when you guys take your uh, advanced web programming, no, advanced JavaScript frameworks, that's what it is, uh, you'll be learning React, which is pretty awesome. Amazon, definitely dynamic. How else would they be able to add products, right? Could you imagine having to statically enter every single product in Amazon? My god, that would be terrible. Um, yeah, so they're obviously dynamic as well. We're not going to go through the rich example. All right, let's talk quickly about this just because I like the animation. A web application is a lot like a pub, right? Bar, pub. Both have something people want to see or use, right? So in the web application, we want to use our Facebook. When we go to the pub, we want the drinks. Both the drinks and the data are kept behind a walled barrier. Right? So for us, on the other side, it's usually authentication or a web application. However, at the pub, it's that big bouncer guy who says, you can't come in. So how do users get what they want? They have to make a request. And they have to make a request to somebody who's listening. So think of the web application as the server, and think of the pub as the server. Right? Hence our wonderful dynamic operation over there, or our bartender. Our bartender will be our server. Makes sense, right? Our request has to be transmitted to where the drinks and data are stored. Instructions are then issued based on our request. So that data gets manipulated, transferred, changed, right? When you go to the bar and you get a drink, it doesn't just come as one ingredient. It comes as like several ingredients if you're drinking cocktails or something like that, right? If things run smoothly, the result of our request eventually gets returned to us. We get our drinks, right? Or we get our web application, if everything is copacetic. And if things run smoothly, the result of our request makes us happy, like that guy. Super happy. So why did I choose PHP? I didn't. I didn't choose PHP. The college chose PHP. They like PHP. And it makes sense, actually. 80% of the web is currently powered by PHP, so even if you have no intentions of ever touching PHP, you're likely going to encounter it at some point. Um, what I will say, though, easy to learn, super dead easy to learn. There's no asynchronicity, there's no threading, there's no compilation. Very easy to start with. Once the tools are set up and the environment is in place, you can get started right away. Um, the syntax is very similar to every other language that you've worked with. You guys have worked in Java and C Sharp? Just Java? Okay, well, even if you just worked in Java, this is definitely easier than Java. 
Um, I can't remember how you define a function in Java. Is it function? Do you use the keyword function? It is. Oh, okay. Right. Okay, so it's more like the way it's done in C without the keyword function. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't code in Java, so <laughs> I don't work a lot with compiled languages in general. So uh, simple syntax, loosely typed. So we'll talk a little bit about loosely typed because you've only worked with strict type languages. Loosely typed, basically, if it it's called duck typed because if it quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, it must be a duck. That's the idea. Um, basically, PHP allows for loose type, which means if you make a variable equal to a string, it already assumes it's a string. You don't need to say it's a string. You don't need to tell it it's a string. You don't need to say it's a boolean. You don't need to say it's a number. PHP is just like, cool, I already get that. Functions have no data types. You don't assign a data type to a function. You just write the function and get it to do its thing and get it to return what you want it to return. PHP will take care of um, the typing in the background. However, PHP 7 does open us up to the ability to data type arguments if we want to. So if we want to enforce a type where a user has to submit an array or has to submit a boolean, we can do that. We can actually force those in PHP 7. PHP makes up 80% of all websites, so like I said, you're likely going to come across it either through WordPress, Joomla, or Drupal, three of the biggest heavy hitters on the web. PHP has an OK that's actually old as a PHP 7. Their object-oriented programming um, background is actually properly object-oriented programming, and it's really good. It's not bad. Uh, many frameworks available for PHP, such as Laravel, KickPHP, Symfony, and CodeIgniter. These are all MVC frameworks, but they're huge. They're, they're, they're big, heavy hitters out there. Uh, and then it's great as a quick prototyping language, especially teaching students how to program web programming. <laughs> It's very good for that because you can get stuff up and running pretty quick. Cool. What other choices do you have in server-side languages? Like I was saying, Ruby, Golang. If you guys love Java, if you're like a huge lover of Java, you can use Java server pages. Um, ASP, if you're into like C Sharp or C++ or any of the C-based languages, you could use ASP.NET with any C, C flavor you choose to. Golang, if you like torture. Rust, if you like torture. Both of those are very, very hard languages to work with. Um, Ruby, beautiful language, reads like poets. That's why I love it. I love it. Um, and then JavaScript, right? I mean, JavaScript's definitely the cake because there's your front end, there's your back end, and there's your database. All JavaScript, all one language, right? But then you got to deal with asynchronousity, which usually throws people on their head. Um, all right, why don't we take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back and we'll install our tools that we're going to use. Cool. Can resume. All right, just before I get into talking about the actual tools we're going to use for our environment setup for PHP, uh, I just want to show you where things are located in your Blackboard shell so you know where to find certain things. Uh, one of the biggest things is the course information, obviously. So this gives you the information of who I am, what my email address is if you need it, the Slack invite link if you need that, uh, and the classroom that you are supposed to be in. One thing to note about the Slack invite, <laughs> Slack will actually set you up through your browser and then you'll have to sign into your browser every time. If you don't want to do that, Windows has a desktop application that you can download that gives you Slack right on the desktop. You can also get it on your phone, your tablets, whatever you want to add it to. There's an app for, for literally every operating system. Um, any of you using Mac? Is there any Mac users in here? That's going to be interesting, because <laughs> you're going to be watching me use a Mac while you guys all use Windows. <laughs> Sorry. Um, make it even more interesting. I use Linux at my job. Super hardcore. <laughs> um, OK, so also, there is the syllabus there, which is just basically what we talked about already. Uh, it breaks it down, the uh, grade amounts, also what's supposed to be covered over the 14 weeks. Um, that being said, these things are not written in stone. They, they can change if we find that the class is, you know, moving very fast or not moving fast enough, right? We can always get into more complex things or scale it back. And then the introductions and expectations slide deck that we went over is right there, so it's easily accessible. The other folder is the resources folder. The resources folder, anything I find that's cool or something that I think you need to know, or that might be beneficial to you will be put under the resources folder. 
The Slack invite link is also there, so you can find it there as well. Uh, links to the different tools we're going to be using, XAMPP, VS Code, GitHub, Heroku are all there as well, plus a link to my GitHub repo, uh, the one that I'll be pushing to, and then also the lesson plans application, which is where you will find our weekly PHP lessons. There's also a JavaScript frameworks lesson up there as well, if you want to like jump ahead and learn about React and Express and Mongo, you can go ahead and do that as well. Uh, feel free, all of that stuff is public information. <clears throat> all right. That was like the perfect amount of time. Now we can install the environments. Now I want to get to PHP syntax, but in reality what I have learned is anytime you're doing tool installations in a class, generally the class just gets sucked up with tool installations, which is probably what's going to happen here. Um, the biggest issues about these particular tools, I'm hoping it's not going to be a huge issue, is permissions on people's systems. So as long as you're not that tinker that's gone in and changed file permissions on your system, you should be okay. <laughs> if not, thank God I know how to solve most of those, so we should be okay. <laughs> Um, that being said, XAMPP is going to be nice and easy. A couple of questions though. Has anybody installed WAMP, MAMP, or XAMPP prior to this class? You have, which one? You have all three? On that computer right now, you have MAMP and XAMPP? Okay, so you might have some issues with some conflicts. If it doesn't, because sometimes what will happen is um, MAMP actually installs its own version of MySQL. XAMPP installs MySQL, and now the system's like, I don't know which one you want to use. <laughs> so you wind up with a conflict. So hopefully we don't have a conflict. Uh, another question. Has anybody manually installed MySQL on their computer? Like manually. So we may have a conflict with your system. Uh, and then the last one is, is anybody running Apache on their computer that they manually installed? No? Okay. So we might be okay. Two people. That's not bad. Uh, let's see how we go. Um, that being said, it might be a totally moot issue. So let's do XAMPP first. So go ahead and under the resources link, click on the XAMPP tab. And that will take you to the XAMPP webpage. <clears throat> so XAMPP is a complete stack. So when we talk about web, we talk about stacks. What stack are you using, man? Like how are you developing your application? What stack are you doing? Right? Oh, dude, I'm using the MERN stack, or I'm using the LAMP stack, or I'm using the RAM stack. Right? There's all these different types of stacks. What a stack describes is what technologies you're using, essentially. So we're going to use the LAMP stack. That's what our stack is going to be, and XAMPP is going to install that for us. LAMP stack stands for L, which is Linux, right? Which is BS, because I'm using a Mac and you guys are using Linux. But it's Linux. Um, Apache, that's our server, that's the thing that's going to be listening to all web requests that come in and transferring them out to the files, remember we were talking about servers? M is MySQL, and P is PHP, that's the LAMP stack. At work I use the MERN stack on occasion, which is Mongo, which is the database, Express, which is the server, React, which is the front-end development part, and Node, which is the uh, back-end server piece. I don't know why they use Express and Node in that sentence, because Express is actually the router, but that's the way it goes. So that's a stack. The cool thing about XAMPP is XAMPP actually manages the stack for us. So it will boot up your Apache server, it gives it a default configuration for you, it immediately installs and runs the PHP version you need, it installs and runs your MySQL database for you. It gives you a tool called PHP by admin, which allows you to interact with your MySQL database easily. It does all that for you. You don't actually have to know how to do that, because it just doesn't, right? You can, if you are so bold enough, manually install Apache Server, manually install PHP, and manually install MySQL. If you don't have a strong, I don't know, a strong technical efficacy, then I don't recommend doing that because you can get into a world of hurt trying to make sure permissions are correct and the settings are correct. So let's just do XAMPP. So go ahead and download XAMPP for whatever your operating system is. Is anybody using Linux in this class? No? Cool. 
and go through the installation. It's just next, 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 next. Don't you do it because you already did it. <laughs> but it's next, 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 next. Let's finish. And once it's done, it should ask you to launch. Cool. I think when it's finished, it asks you to launch it. And go ahead and say yes to launch again. Now, the one kind of annoying side to this is your XAMP is going to look slightly different than my XAMP, um, which is weird because the XAMP on Linux also looks different. Like all three versions do not look the same. Uh, so hopefully this isn't going to be too much of a nightmare. I'll open mine so that it's open. And that's what mine will look like. Minimize this so you can see it. Need to see a screenshot for it. Oh, right, it looks like that. Takes a little while to download because it's downloading the HTML and the C4 and a whole bunch of other things that came up in the HTML. When it loads, it should look something like this. Once you've launched it, it should be kind of like this type of thing. The only things we're going to concern ourselves, the only tools we're going to use, are the Apache and MySQL tools. No, because we're not going to have TP files. We're going to use FTP. FTP is fairly easy to learn, but it's not the most common thing you'll use in the industry. So. All right, while we're waiting on XAMPP to download and launch, why don't we get our ID? So now you have a choice of whatever ID you want to use. Now I know some of you probably, who did you have for an HTML feature? Scott? Scott? Scott's awesome. So Scott is a big Atom lover. Does he, did he use Atom or brackets? Atom? Yeah. So if you're using Atom and you like Atom and you want to keep using Atom, go for it. That's totally fine. Uh, the two that I like to use are Sublime. That was my go-to. Now I use uh, VS Code, and I kind of love VS Code. That's VS Code. Um, and VS Code, it's basically the same as the other guys, as Sublime or any of the other ones. My biggest reason for loving VS Code is because I get this very cool retro 80s theme. That's like my favorite thing. But uh, yeah, that's probably one of the only reasons I changed over. But. Um, yeah, so I'll be using VS Code. Uh, it doesn't matter which one you use, because the IDE is not necessarily the biggest thing. <clears throat> but one thing I do tend to do is I'll show you little interactions you can do in your IDE to make your development a lot faster, like uh, multi-cursor. So you can have like five cursors in a row and type the same thing in five different locations. Uh, Multi-copy paste. Moving lines up and down, stuff like that. Just being able to navigate in your uh, editor a lot quicker. I did put the link to VS Code. VS Code is completely free. You don't need a license for it. Sublime is not free. You do need a license for Sublime. Um, but yeah, VS Code is what I'll be using. All right, where are we at with this uh, excellent? Good. Watch.
All right. Uh, hold on. Let me see if the services are similar. All right. So in your in your example, <coughs> I'll have to open up the picture I found. All right. So in your example, you'll see these little start buttons here. The only two we're going to run is the Apache one and the MySQL one. That's it. Okay. FileZilla is for uh, doing FTP. FTP is a way to transfer files from your local machine up to a server. Um, however, it's kind of in the past. We don't really use FTP very much. Uh, now we generally use SFTP, which is like the safe file transfer protocol. Um, once you become more skilled, you use SCP, which is secure copy. Um, which is like a Linux command. And then even more advanced than that is using a proper deployment solution like pushing to GitHub and then having GitHub immediately push to your um, deployment solution using a hook, which is what we're going to learn in this class, uh, which is actually super simple. We basically just push our files up to GitHub and then Heroku will listen and grab the files and immediately install them for us, which is super awesome. Uh, but we'll be doing that quite a bit later. <clears throat> okay, cool. So, go ahead and hit start. If things are good, you will get a little green light. I think it's green light. A little green light under Apache and a little green light under Microsoft. If one of these are red, you're going to get a little green light. If one of these are red, then that means we have an issue either with MySQL or with Apache. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to start mine up. I get one little light. Currently, it's yellow. Come on. It might take a few seconds for it to actually start up.
Make sure you click allow access because if you say no, then it won't let it run. Okay. We need to run as administrator. 
<laughs> so once it puts back up. <laughs> I'm walking over there and dumping into the trash can. <laughs> All right. So if you're running, cool. Not a big deal if you're not running. It's okay. We'll, we'll deal with that even at the end of class if we have to. <clears throat> but if you're running, awesome. Okay. So we have to actually set up where we're going to put our files. And even if your XAMPP is not running perfectly, that's okay because where we're actually going to put the files it doesn't, it doesn't rely on XAMPP running. When we install XAMPP, XAMPP actually creates this directory called htdocs. doesn't matter what operating system you're using, every single one of them gets this htdocs folder. That folder is important. Remember how I said the server dictates where, what files it will read? It's like senior proof. It says you can only access files in this directory. That's our htdocs directory. <clears throat> it's the directory that is exposed to the public. It's the only directory exposed to the public. Which means all traffic coming in will access that directory and only files within that directory will be exposed out to the net. Okay? However, because we're developing locally, it's only us that we got to worry about. We don't have to worry about the outside world accessing our computers. Okay? Because we're developing locally. We're only building on our computers. So the way we get to that directory, there's a few different ways. If you're in Windows, you're going to have to open up your Finder or your Explorer, as you guys call it. And in your Explorer, you're going to go to Dependent. If you installed it under Program Files, you're going to have to go to Program Files. You need to go to wherever the XAMPP is installed. Most of you are likely under C, XAMPP. So go to C Directory and then to XAMPP. Mine is in a very annoying location, I am sure. You can also click the folder. Um, I think yours actually has the folder on it. I think it's the Explorer option underneath your control panel. It will take you directly there. I don't know if I can get to mine like that. Oh, yeah. Mine's in a super awesome location. Just ignore what I'm doing. Cool. All right. All right. So once you have that directory open, make sure you're in the htdocs directory. So just scroll through the list, find htdocs, and open your htdocs file folder. Inside there, you're going to see this wonderful chunk of stuff. <coughs> what that stuff is, is it's your XAMPP dashboard. And the way we can actually view our XAMPP dashboard is you can open up any browser that you have, so whatever browser you prefer. The only one I'm not going to make, the only ones that I won't make fun of are Chrome, Firefox, I won't make fun of those, and Safari, I'll even let you away with Safari, but if you're using Internet Explorer, I'm going to humiliate you. It's a terrible browser. All right, so open that up. Go to localhost. One word. Actually, let's put HTTP in front of it just in case. HTTP colon slash slash localhost. And hit enter. Now, those of you who do not have a running server, it's not going to work for you. It's going to fail. It's not localhost.com. Get me to my application. Oh, mine is different than yours. 
Yours will be local host. Like, HTTP local host. Did that work? So we're not going to overwrite this dashboard because this dashboard has some handy links like the PHP my admin link, which we're going to use later on in order to set up our MySQL databases. <clears throat> so we're going to leave that intact. What we're going to do instead is we're going to create a new subfolder for us, and then we're going to build our lessons under each one of those subfolders. Okay? So what that's going to look like is in your explorer, right, in your file explorer, you're going to create a new directory, probably right click and new, um, or control shift N might work too. I can't remember how you create new directories with the short key in Windows. Uh, and that directory is going to be called comp all titles 10006, dash, sorry, 10006. You don't have to call it that, that's what I'm calling. So now you, underneath your HD docs folder, you have a new folder called comp10006. <coughs> All right. Let's go into that folder. Double click so you're in that folder. So we're going to create a new folder in here, and we're going to create this new folder every week. This week's folder will be called Lesson-01. Okay, so you have HD docs. I'm going to roll back just so you can see what's going on here. So this is our HD docs folder. Under HD docs folder, we have a comp 1006 folder, and we have a lesson one folder. Right? The naming of these is not important. Where it becomes important is when we want to access the files in here, in our URL, we're going to have to go to comp 1006 and lesson one. That's how we get which we'll do in one second. In order for our server to actually deliver a page, we have to either give it an index.html, or because we're using Apache, and Apache has PHP linked up to it right now, we can give it an index.php page. So we might as well give it one of the two, so that at least we can see that we have the index.php page there, and PHP is running for us, okay? So to do that, we need an ID. You can use Atom, if that's what you were using before, VS Code, which is my personal preference, or Sublime, or anything else. Maybe not NetBeans, but you can use anything else. <laughs> Don't use Visual Studio. That's like taking a jackhammer when you need like a thumbtack. <laughs> There's no reason to use Visual Studio. That thing is massive. All right, so I'm going to go to Visual Studio Code. I'm going to go to File, and you can likely do this in every one of those IDEs I mentioned. You can go to File and Open. <coughs> we need to navigate to where that directory is that we created. Mine's in a super annoying location. I wonder if I can even get there. Uh, where's Ott? I don't even know where this directory is. One moment, I just have to find the actual directory here. Oh, that's cool.
God, they're down there. Oh, that's super annoying. All right. Fortunately, I'm back. <clears throat> so you should have the folder open in your ID. Now Adam Sublime brackets and Visual Studio Code all allow for file creation directly in the ID. So we should be able to create a new file directly under this folder that has the issue. All you have to do is right click on the sidebar here where that folder is, choose new file, and then give your file a name, which we're going to call index.php. And make sure it's in the lesson folder. So in order to know whether or not the PHP compiler is working, there's a very common practice that people do in order to see what version of PHP they have. PHP requires us to use a set of tags to tell the, the transpiler what is PHP, right? Tells the interpreter what is PHP. Tags are very easy. It's a bracket with a question mark followed by the letters. PHP. And then it's closed with a question mark and a greater than symbol. And then all your PHP code goes in between those two brackets. If your file is a PHP only file and does not contain any other type of text in that file, you can actually get rid of the bottom closing code, like the bottom closing tag. It's implied, as long as the file is pure PHP. For now, we'll just keep closing it out until we get a little bit more further in the course. The command we're going to use is a function that's built into PHP called PHP info. PHP info will actually show us all the information about the PHP version that we have installed. So PHP info. And it's a function call. We know it's a function because we have these parentheses following the call. That's how we know it's a function call. Those parentheses are what signifies that it's a function call. We start with the symbol name, and then we have the parentheses. Probably the same in every language. <laughs> so now we get the task of navigating to the stupid file in our address bar. So if you jump back over to Google Chrome, it's not in dashboard, it's actually in comp 1006 lesson 01 and you have to do it the exact way that you titled your file folders. Okay? Don't use lowercase when it's uppercase, that type of thing. And we can type index.php but it is implied. We don't have to. I'll write it in great big letters. I'm only writing it once, so if you're on this side, you have to come over there. So it's comp 10, 0, 0, 6, those are zeros, slash zero one slash As long as you titled your directories that way. If you didn't title your directories that way, it's not that. <laughs> so what this should show you is that our server 
It's just a computer. It's this computer, the computer sitting in front of you. And Apache is basically saying, this file folder right here, and into this file folder, and then into this file. It's literally just the same as you opening a file on your computer. It's no real difference, except for that the Apache server is what's opening the file. And if you did it correctly, you should see PHP version probably 7.3.9, because that's the one that's installed with XAMPP, which is the latest version of PHP. Supports typecasting and stuff like that. Has a bunch of new features in it. Right. Does it work on brackets? Works in any of them. So let's make sure we're in the correct file. So let's go back to brackets and just make sure we get that That is not in the lesson. Got it? So all PHP is, every statement that you write is closed by a semicolon. Okay, so we've got two of the tools installed so far. Um, we can talk about extensions, but a lot of you aren't using VS Code, so there's really no point. So one thing you want to make sure, like 100% make sure, is that you're getting syntax highlighting from your 
I think because it will make coding PHP a lot better if it's not just all white or black text, right? You want to make sure that it's actually color coded so you have a clue what's a function. You can quickly see that's a function, that's a string, that's a variable, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> just based on time, I think we'll push our GitHub Heroku lesson until next week because it's a little bit more involved. Uh, but we will be using GitHub. And we will be using Heroku. <coughs> that being said, guys, that being said, though, I'm not married to using GitHub or Heroku. If you already are using a Git solution like Bitbucket or Gitfire, you can continue to use that solution. Um, and if you don't want to push to Heroku and you want to use Azure, because uh, I think you guys get Azure for free for like a year or something like that, um, or DreamSpark or whatever, you're welcome to do that as well. I would recommend using Heroku. It will make your life really easy. It's completely free. You don't need a credit card for it. You don't need any crap with it. It just works. And the best thing about it is it actually interprets your code and sets up your environment to work with that code, which makes your lives really simple. Um, not that Azure's terrible. Azure works OK. Um, but I have had a lot of students that wind up capping out their, their free tier pretty fast. So. Heroku will always be free. So, um, cool. Plus, Heroku is like a big industry standard. Well, so is Azure. But. All right. Let's do some PHP syntax. Why don't we take a 10 minute break? We'll do a PHP syntax when we get back. Um, and then we'll wrap up a bit early. Cool? All right. So, that. Accomplish in 45 minutes. <coughs> So if you can go to Blackboard for me, under Blackboard, under the weekly learning. So weekly learning, lesson one. <coughs> At the very bottom, you'll see the lesson one starter files. We want to download these, but we want to download them into that htdocs directory and extract them in that htdocs directory. Okay, so if you click on it, it should just auto download, navigate to where that htdocs directory is and download it into there. Mine's a much more annoying spot. Oh, that's cool. Awesome, one, and save. It should go down pretty quick. It's just web files. They should download pretty fast. Next, you're going to want to navigate to that directory in your file explorer and extract that file. Now, it's going to create a lesson one file for you. Just open it up, grab the content that's in there, and move it into the main directory and choose to replace everything that's in there. And then we can just delete those, the directory and the, um, the directory and the, whatchamacallit. So it will look like this. Comp 1006, lesson one, and you'll have four files, dynamic.php, index.php, PHP syntax.php and static.html. And just to make sure you have all four files, if you go back to your app that you have open and hit refresh, you should likely get a bunch of errors. We'll correct those errors in one second. So let's go ahead and fix those errors. I think what we'll do is just create a quick like table of contents kind of thing so that we can easily navigate to the other three files. So in our IDE, 
You'll notice now that those files should be on the left-hand side of your sidebar. I'm going to collapse my sidebar just for real estate so that you guys can see the code and not the sidebar. And I've got index.php open here. I'm just going to hit Command A or Control A in your case and hit delete and just clear the file so it's an empty file. I then save it. So, just curious how well you remember HTML. What's the first line of HTML we need? The doc type. So let's go ahead and write our doc type, which I can never remember what it is. Thank God for Emmett. There it is. So that's our HTML5 doc type, right? Next line we'll need is the HTML and the closing tag for HTML. We're going to need a head and a body. Here's your first IDE shortcut. If you put your cursor in a spot, I'm going to put my cursor in the spot between the two head tags. I'm going to hold down control, and I'm going to put my cursor in the middle of the body tags. So now I have two cursors. And then I'm going to hit enter to split them up. Want me to do it again? Okay. All right, so I'm going to put my cursor in between the two head tags. Then I'm going to hold down control, and I'm going to put my cursor in the middle of the body tags. And you'll get two cursors. Isn't that cool? And then you hit enter, and hit enter one more time, and now it splits them all up. <laughs> Wait, what is this magic? Tell me once more. <laughs> you put your cursor in between the head tag, hold down control on your keyboard, put the cursor between the body tags, now you have two cursors, and you can do that as many times as you want. And then you can hit enter and control them at the same time. It's super handy, especially if you have to make like a whole pile of LIs or something like that. All right, in our head, super simple, we're just going to do a title. Okay, And the title will just be lesson one, or whatever you want to call it, doesn't really matter. And I mean, let's be semantic a little bit. Some nice semantic HTML, right? So we'll do a header. Close out the header. Write an H1. And we'll just write table of contents in the H1. Want to write some PHP? Want to write some PHP that you won't necessarily understand right away? All right, let's do that. Let's uh, create a set of PHP tags. I'm a notoriously lazy person. That's why programming is really good for me, because it forces me to build applications to make my life lazier and easier, right? And I don't really feel like writing out four li tags. I'd rather write out one li tag and then just have it populate four times. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to use a little bit of PHP. I'm going to create an array that contains the link and the title. And I'm going to do that as four nested arrays. And then we're going to iterate through them and spit them out as li tags. Cool? Cool. So first we want to create the array part of it. Um, so let's create a variable. A variable in PHP, very simple. It's dollar sign to signify to the interpreter that we're creating a variable, and your symbol name. 
Symbol names, just like in Java, cannot contain spaces, cannot contain dashes. You can use underscores, you can use another dollar sign, which you will often see, and you can use um, camel case or whatever you want that way. That's fine. Just no spaces, no dashes, right? It also can't begin with a number, which is like pretty standard across the board for variable naming, but it's something that you need to know. Um, it also doesn't support emoticons, but Ruby does, which is super annoying to other developers when you start using emoticons as variable names. <laughs> All right, anyways, uh, let's create a variable. Um, what are we going to call this? Uh, TOC, TOC, table of contents, right? Makes sense to me. And to make an array, we can do it in two different ways. We can either do array as a function call and then load it with stuff, but I really hate that syntax because it looks like garbage. So what I do instead is the shorthand, which is a set of parentheses, because it's nice and clear. PHP does support um, defining syntax on multiple lines. So if you want to keep things nice and clean looking and like actually human readable, we can split this up like so, and then we can write our stuff on each line. A weird thing in PHP. So you guys have done Java. I think Java supports lists and dictionaries. Dictionaries would probably be the closest to what this is. Correct me if I'm wrong, a dictionary is a key and a value, right? The keys have to be of some data class, right? So it has to be a string. If you're going to use a string, all keys have to be strings. Is that how they work? You can't have one a number and one a string for data keys. You don't know. Okay. So <laughs> if I'm correct, the way the data dictionaries work in Java, you have a list of keys and you have a list of value. And when you want to reference a value, you reference the key to get the value, right? PHP doesn't have separate dictionaries. Ruby does, they're known as hashes, right? Uh, Python does, they use a hash syntax as well. PHP uses the same structure for dictionaries, lists, hashes, everything. Everything all underneath one structure, and that's arrays. So the annoying part is arrays generally start at what index number? Right. They start at zero in PHP as well. But the important thing to understand is that index number is actually a key because all arrays in PHP are dictionaries. All of them. Doesn't matter which one. So the annoying part to that is when you delete an element from the array, it can fudge up the index numbers, which can be super annoying. <laughs> just keep that in mind. It's not something you come across very often, but just keep it in mind. All right, so we're going to create a hash or a dictionary. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to use the URLs as keys, and we're going to use the titles as the actual value, kind of like double dipping a little bit, right? OK, so we're going to need the actual URL names. So let me just see what they are. Dynamic, static, PHP syntax. Yeah, that's easy to remember. Um, OK, so the first piece will be, uh, let's do static.html. And to denote the value, we do something, uh, some people call it a hash rocket. It's an equal sign with a little arrow. It's an arrow. It's like my key is pointing to my value. That's literally what you're kind of doing. And then the value will be static HTML. Here, I'll make this big so that you can see it all in one line, not multiple lines. So that's our key and our value. Let's do another one. Dynamic.html, hash rocket, dynamic HTML. And I'm not making these up, I'm pulling them from our file names over here on the left hand side. And then the last one, actually, we'll create two more. The bottom one here will be php syntax. Dot PHP, hash rocket, PHP syntax, and I already made a mistake. I said dynamic.html, but it isn't. It's dynamic.php. 
because that's the name of the file. We're going to create one more at the top just for our home. And home will just be to index.php. And we'll call that home. And we've got to make sure we put the comma at the end of it because it's a list. And then save it. <clears throat> so now we have our hash, right, or our array, but if we were to go to our browsers and look at our browsers, you won't see it. And the reason is, is because the interpreter will interpret it, but it doesn't actually have anything to transmit to the browser. We haven't actually created any HTML from it. We're not spitting any of the information out to the browser. The browser can't see this array. So if you jump over to your ID or to your actual browser piece, and I'll just move this over to the left hand side, and I hit refresh, see I can only see table of contents. I don't actually see all those details. If I want to see the details in this array, what I can do is I can use one of the very many debugging mechanisms that are built into PHP to actually be able to display the contents of my array. The first one I'm going to show you is called var dump. So just hit enter after that semicolon, right, which signifies the end of our statement. And we're going to type var underscore dump. It's a function call. It takes one argument, and that argument is your value that you want to dump. So we're going to dump toc, our array. Save that. And now if you hit refresh, you'll see our array contents actually spit out in the uh, browser for us. Here, I'll zoom in a bit. So you can see it gives quite a bit of information. It tells you it's an array that contains four elements. That's what that first number means. It tells you what this key is and what its value is. It also tells you the value is a string that contains four characters. And it does that throughout this piece. Sometimes you don't need all that information. Sometimes it's quite a bit of information that's not necessary. So what you can do is you can use var export dollar sign toc and var export is like a lighter version of that. And if you hit refresh, this is our var export chunk. Notice now we don't get the data type or the character number or the value of whatever it is. You'll also notice that var dump and var export are actually printing technically on the same line. In order to split those up, we would have to inject a bit of HTML. We can't use the new line character because that's not going to work for us because this is not a terminal or a text document, it's HTML. The new line character in HTML is the break tag. So in order to get the break tag to spit out, we need to use a very common PHP function that you are literally going to write probably 5,000 times in this class. And that is echo. Echo. And you can write echo like a function with the brackets, but you don't have to. You can actually write echo as a shorthand with just echo toc. And then when you refresh, you're going to get an error. <laughs> the reason is is because echo can actually only output a string. It's not capable, sorry, it can output a string, a boolean, a number, all those are fine, single values. It cannot output objects or hashes or arrays. It's not capable of it. So let's change this to what we were going to write before I made my mistake, which is our br tag, which we have to put in quotes. You can use single quotes or double quotes, totally your choice. Some people will argue that one does make a difference over the other. It does kind of. Double quotes actually support something called string interpolation in PHP, which we'll look at later. But now you can see that the var exports on this line and the var dump is on that line. All right. Our next step is we're going to create a loop a loop that will iterate over all of our hash and spit it out into nice little li tags under a ul list for us. So we're going to need a ul list, so we're going to step out of our PHP block, 
That's what we're going to call the content in between our tags. We're going to call that a block. So we're going to step out of the block, out of the tags, and we're going to write a simple UL, close our UL, right? And now I want to iterate and create all my little LIs. I'll give you a second to write out those ULs. So the cool thing about PHP is we can step into PHP and step out of PHP in our HTML document. So other languages require you to use things like templates and stuff like that. We don't need to do that with PHP. PHP supports us stepping in and out of HTML throughout our HTML document, which is super awesome because it means that we get to litter our dynamic text right directly in our HTML. So we can see that by doing question mark PHP, we're going to write an inline PHP. So we signify it by inline by the fact that it's all on one line. That's really all that that means, right? We're going to write a for each statement. There are different repetition structures in, in uh, PHP. Many of you already know the for loop, probably one of the most common iterators in every language. I can't think of a language that doesn't support a for loop. Um, the while loop, right, also very common. Do while loop, very common. All three of those structures are supported in PHP, and the syntax for them looks identical in PHP, Python, C, C++, basically a lot of languages supports that same type of syntax. However, PHP also supports something called a for each loop. The purpose of a for each loop is to iterate over the contents of an array. So normally what you would do is use a for loop, count your array, and then iterate over the number of items that come back from the count. But for the for each makes it a lot easier because the for each allows you to just automatically iterate over those elements without needing to do any pre-count. In addition, it will assign each item off to a throwaway variable that you can now use inside that little for each block. Even better than that, it will split it out. If it's a key and a value, it will split it out into a key variable and a value variable, which are now both accessible with inside the block, which means we can take advantage of that kind of cool little hack and make index PHP our key, right, and home our value and access both of those from inside there and create a really cool little LI tech. So first we got to write the for each loop. The for each loop is a function call. It looks like this, for each, like that. And I'm going to extend my IDE window a little bit and shrink my other window a little bit just because this gets kind of lengthy. The first argument to our for each loop is going to be the array we want to iterate over. So that's the TOC. The next is the throwaway variable we want to do, and the syntax looks like this, as, so we say TOC as, and you can say item. If you leave it as this, what will happen is each one of these values will be stored into item, and that's it. You won't get the key. You will only get the value. To get the key, we need to add a piece of before this. So we can say title, or sorry, path, hash rocket, item. And what this basically says is this is your key, this is your value. And these are just throwaway variables. You can call this key and call this value if you wanted to do that to help you remember what those are. Or we can call them what makes sense, which is path, title because that's what they are. We end this either with a curly brace, but then we need to make sure we close our curly brace, or we can use the shorthand when we're doing inline PHP, which is a colon. To close out our for each loop, we'll need to do another inline PHP, and its simple statement will be end for each. What's that? It's out of the other thing, because we're going to write that wonderful li tag in between them. This might seem confusing, but if you look at it, it kind of makes sense. 
Here's the opening to my 4-H loop. Here's the closing to my 4-H loop. Anything written in between these two tags is going to repeat, right? Everything inside those two tag, in between those two tags, will repeat. So if I write an li tag in there now, we're going to get that li tag produced as number of times as we have array entries. How many array entries do we have? Four. So let's go ahead and write that out. I like to tab in. Some people don't. They like to write it in line. It's totally preferential up to you. But I'm going to tab in. I'm going to do li and a closing li because I know I'm going to need those. I'm also going to need a link tag, right? How do we create an anchor tag? What is it? CA. CA. And A's need a href or an href. One of the guys I work with is making fun of me because I say href. And now our href is actually going to be the path, right? But we want to tell it where to start from. So first, we're going to give it the directory, right? So that basically says this directory. Dot slash says this directory, the one that we are currently in. Now I want to actually spit out my PHP. So I have to somehow jump into PHP within this current tag. And it might seem hard, but it's not. And we can actually use a little bit of shorthand. So first we'll write it the long way, and then we'll shorten it. So we can do PHP, just like we would. We just create a block right there. Echo, dollar sign path. And what that will do is it will evaluate our path variable and return it back and spit it out. And this will say dot slash whatever the path is. But as you can see, that gets lengthy. And like I said, you're going to write this like 5,000 times, almost literally 5,000 times. So you don't want to have to write PHP echo. We can actually save ourselves eight characters if you include the space. We just simply highlight PHP echo and change that to an equal sign. And that means exactly the same thing. So that gives us our link. Now we need our title. So put your cursor in between the middle of your anchor opening tag and closing tag. And let's do that same PHP structure again. Only this time we're going to evaluate title. And I'll make this nice and big for you. And then you can see it. Now, if you want to make it nicely formatted so it's a little easier to read, you can put your A tag on the next line, your LI tag there. You could even break up your anchor tags like so. I mean, it's so small, one liner makes sense, but if you want to break them up, it might be a little easier to read that way. So incidentally, the quiz has opened up. You have till midnight tomorrow. There's five questions on that quiz. They're only questions pertaining to the introductions and expectations. It's not this stuff. This stuff will be next week. So incidentally, that's it. That's it for all of that. So if you go over to the browser and hit refresh, you now have four links. And if you click on the link, it should take you to the pages. You'll have to click the back button to go back to your table of contents, but you get the idea. So it's 9.42. I think we're good, right? You guys good? Yeah, we're good. Next week, we'll actually do the PHP syntax. Um, all this syntax that we just did today, we're going to explain it a little bit more in detail. We're going to talk about commenting, um, how to actually create the different variables and the data types that are supported, as well as hashes and objects and stuff like that. But we'll do that next week. Hope you guys have a great night. Yeah, I can scroll down.